just a heads up, y'all, this episode has some vulgar and homophobic language. Just be advised. What's good, everybody? You're listening to Code Switch. I'm Gene Demby, and this week, I'm joined by Wo Jingnan. Hey, Jingnan. What's good? Hey, Jing. So Jingnan is one of our colleagues here at NPR, and she covers how information gets made, how it gets disseminated, right? Yes, and as part of that, I cover how conspiracy theories travel and spread. Okay, so <laughs> you're on the tinfoil hat beat, right? Okay. Uh, yes, but not <laughs> just that. Um, I cover the entire information environment, both online and offline. Thanks social media, chat groups, mm-hmm. television, schools, workplaces, churches. So basically anywhere we get our information. Got it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That is a, a very important beat, especially right now. I mean, I think so. You are here today at Code Switch because we are on the race beat. And I know that on this episode, we're going to go down a rabbit hole with you. I guess we got to pull our whiteboard and get the, you know, the red markers and start drawing connections. Because you're going to walk us through a phenomenon that lands right at the intersection of our two beats, right? Race Mm -hmm. and conspiracies. Yes. Cue anti-Semitism, white anxiety, and a healthy dose of xenophobia. Okay, okay. The conspiracy theory goes Mm -hmm. that global elites are plotting to force ordinary people like you and me Mm -hmm. to eat bugs. Wait. What? To eat bugs? Yeah, I know, I know. What? That's how I started. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Let's take this piece by piece. Okay, global elites. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, uh, that's been kind of a wink toward this old anti-Semitic idea Mm -hmm. that they're like Jewish financiers who are secret puppet masters running the world from behind the scenes, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And there's more to the theory than just this wink. To give you a taste of what this looks like, let me take you across the Atlantic to the Netherlands. Okay, to the Netherlands. Um, hmm. Let me just grab some clogs and make sure they match my tinfoil hat. You know what I mean? You gotta coordinate. You gotta coordinate. Okay, I want to show you this video. So this is a leader of a far-right populist party in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. The guy's name is Thierry Baudet, and he's speaking at a protest of Dutch farmers. The farmers are protesting against a European Union plan to cut nitrogen emissions that could involve the Dutch government buying out meat-producing farms with high emissions. Hmm, Okay, so in this clip, uh, this guy, he's holding a plastic bag of something, like one of those bags of granola or jerky or something like that. And now he's dumping them out onto the stage. But wait, 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 wait. Mealworm. He said mealworms? That is indeed what he's saying. Mealworms? Like the, the little wriggly larva joints. Yes. Okay. They're the second part of the beetle's life cycle. And just a few months ago, the EU said it's okay for mealworms to be in human food in Europe. Uh... So they're often ground up or dried and roasted as snacks. And I think those look like whole mealworms. All right, so um, I'm supposed to be a dispassionate NPR journalist here, Jingnam, but I am screaming right now. Oh, my God, I'm so good. I'm never eating a mealworm, I promise you. Y'all can have the mealworms, Dutch people. It's all y'all. Y'all good. No way! Okay, so you agree with Thierry Baudet. <laughs> I guess I do. No way, Dutch way! Now he switches back to Dutch. He's saying he's not going to have Dutch food production and way of life and beautiful countryside taken from Dutch farmers. And then the speech turns back to his regular talking points, that schools are pushing the, quote, transgender propaganda, Mm -hmm. that climate change is a hoax, and so is COVID-19. All right, so it's just kind of like a grab bag of conspiracy stuff, right? But Jingnan, like... What's good with the bugs? I thought that farmers were stressed out about meat production. Like, what is this? Yeah, yeah. Stay with me. Mm-hmm. Back on our side of the Atlantic, when Tucker Carlson covered this Dutch protest, he made the connection between bugs and meat farmers explicit. Insects are a replacement for meat. That's not always articulated, but it's always the point. The Netherlands is Tucker Carlson, of course, was Europe. the star of Fox News. His nightly news program had the highest rating of any show on cable news before he got fired from Fox just a couple, not too long ago. Yes, and that clip is from a TV special on Fox Nation he hosted a few days before he was fired. Hmm. It's called Let Them Eat Bugs. Let Them Eat Bugs, okay. So he's trying to prove this conspiracy theory that big government, in this case the European Union and the current Dutch government, is trying to crack down on the meat industry so they can push people into eating bugs. Hmm. This is not the first time Tucker Carlson has had opinions about bugs, though. This is him back in 2019. Well, because eating insects is repulsive and un-American. And other conservative media personalities in America talked about edible insects too. Here's Alex Jones on his streaming show, InfoWars. Coming food crisis recommends more sustainable diets of, wait for it, fly larva, 
fly larva fly larva you're letting the globalists train you to be a slave all of this is alien to the normal way of life and michael knows hosts the show at the daily wire i don't want to live like a peasant in the middle of some jungle in Vietnam. I want to live like a civilized person with the cultural inheritance. I'm not going to eat the bugs. The bugs are gross. All right, there you go. There you go. I was waiting for it. Mm. You know, we all know un-American, I put my air quotes, mm. is kind of a dog whistle, right? That last clip kind of lays bare the subtext. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, okay. Can we just, for, just... Is this bug thing even real, though? Like, what exactly has them so agitated around eating bugs? Like, what's going on? It's not that big a deal, actually. You know, using bugs as an alternative protein source for people has been floated by some environmentalists and some entrepreneurs who want to sell, like, cricket protein powder. Okay. But it's a tiny, fledgling market in the U.S. Like, currently, it's often more expensive than beef. Wow. But mostly experts focused on climate solutions are just saying that we need to eat less meat, like not switch into bugs. Huh. So I've I've seen some of those stories about, you know, eating bugs to help save the planet. Um, Again, that's not my journey. Uh, We're not eating bugs on this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Disappointing. Um, (laughs) So uh, if it's not that big a deal, like why are folks like Thierry Baudet in the Netherlands and Tucker Carlson here all up in arms about it? Well, right now, it may be because it has become part of an even bigger conspiracy theory. Hmm. I did some digging on the internet, and this merging seems to have begun with this anonymous blog post in 2019. All I could find out about the person who wrote it is that they call themselves a white identitarian. So they're a white supremacist of some sort. Yeah, and you have to tweets to back it up. Mm. Um, And in the days after the Notre Dame Cathedral caught fire in Paris, this blogger went on this rant saying that the fire was on purpose, that it was not only an attack on Christianity and Christendom, but another sign of global elites being sadists and wanting to punish and enslave people around the world. Okay. Hmm. And uh, then the blog post took a turn. This person wrote, quote, Have you noticed there is quite a lot of research going into turning bugs into mass food projects? Hmm. So this person's blog post is, as far as you can tell, the earliest instance for explicitly linking bug eating Mm -hmm. to all these other far-right concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, this person thinks that white folks are under attack and they're trying to sound the alarm. Right. Huh. And then on 4chan, where a lot of far-right conspiracy theorists like to gather... Mm -hmm. I will not eat the box started to get turned into a meme. People were posting it again and again, sometimes under the photo of the climate activist Greta Thunberg. The users on 4chan are anonymous, but we can see on these threads that some accounts have Nazi flags and white supremacist flags next to their IDs. So these phrases and ideas are sort of just bumping up against each other in the trolly, unholy cauldron that is 4chan. Yeah. Hmm. And then the phrase, I would not eat the box, crossed from 4chan over to Twitter. First by way of, again, a white nationalist. People started pairing that phrase with another one. I will not live in a pod. Huh? I will not live in a pod? Yeah, they're referring to these tiny co-living spaces. Some people are worried that the powers that be are going to force people into a kind of communal living. Okay, so these anxieties are about like deprivation and uh, status loss, and they start to roll downhill and pick up. More stuff as they go, it seems. Yeah. Then a popular crypto investor who is on Twitter used the phrase, I will not live in a pod, I will not eat the bugs, to poke fun at climate change proposals. Another early propagator of the phrase told me he tweeted it only as a joke and did not expect it to become a rallying cry. Either way, this phrase, I will not live in a pod and I will not eat the bugs, kept spreading. Hmm. So from 4chan to Twitter and then... Some shit posting just made it a bigger deal. And so it sounds like, as with so many of these things, it's really hard to tell, like, how seriously any of the people who are throwing this phrase around really are being. Right, totally. And that even bigger conspiracy theory has its own name and its own backstory. Thierry Baudet, your Dutch friend, <laughs> name checks it at the farmers' protest. The Great Reset. The Great Reset is what's behind all of this. He says. The Great Reset. I mean, that sounds 
Very ominous. Yeah, me. right? But this name comes from this very confusing initiative by the World Economic Forum, like this group of veritable global elites that meet annually in the Swiss Alps. The World Economic Forum, that's Davos, right? That's mm-hmm. the big Davos festival convention. I'm not sure what it is. It happens every year. It gets a yep. lot of attention. Yeah. Yep, that's how many people might know it. Yeah. Uh, if you think the global system is secretly being run by like powerful, unelected people who get to set the global agenda, like this annual meeting in Davos... With a bunch of obscenely rich people and thought leaders just kicking it at a closed meeting of some sort. I don't know what they're doing there. That's a big blinking piece of at least circumstantial evidence <laughs> in favor of that argument, right? Yeah. The WF meeting at Davos has captured conspiracy theorists' imaginations for a long time. Mm-hmm. And the Great Reset was this initiative that the forum launched in June 2020, after most of the world went into lockdown because of COVID-19. So the Great Reset was like full of policy proposals? Uh, it's mostly just vibes. I mean, it's all very vague. <laughs> okay. The WEF said that lockdowns were really bad and they exposed all sorts of inequities in our societies. Yeah, that's true. We covered that. But... Right. Mm-hmm. And the World Economic Forum said governments need to do a better job of caring for the citizens. Mm-hmm. Here's a snippet of the organization itself trying to explain the initiative. With everything falling apart, we can reshape the world in ways we couldn't before. Ways that better address so many of the challenges we face. And that's why so many are calling for a great reset. Reshape the world. I mean, okay, a bunch of questions there. But but first, how? How do they plan to do this? Yeah, fair question. They didn't really say. Hmm. And this video is them trying to explain themselves again. Like after conspiracy theorists have been stuffing all sorts of stories under the great reset name. Things like. Uh, governments are forcing you to stay at home and wear a mask. Or, like, take the vaccine. Yes, exactly. It's been construed as a ploy to control the population and take away your freedoms for good. Like, you can hear the WEF trying to address that concern here. A great reset? That sounds more like buzzword bingo masking some nefarious plan for world domination. Hands up, this kind of slogan hasn't gone down well. But all we really want to say is that we all have an opportunity to build a better world. I got to say, like, even in their own explanation there, they sound mad defensive. Like, if you're a conspiracy theorist, that might make you even more suspicious of the people at Davos and WEF, right? Yeah, they're trying to debunk or pre-bunk, depending on how you look at it. I like pre-bunk. That's cool. (laughs) Not very effective for either way. (laughs) The, The actual Great Reset initiative that sprung out of Davos is still vague and sprawly. Kind of like the Great Reset conspiracy theory that took on its name. The conspiracy theory goes that there were shadowy puppeteers behind governments. Before it's called the Great Reset, it had a different name, the New World Order. Oh, yeah. Okay, Mm -hmm. that's the throwback. That was a big deal in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Um, Pat Robertson, the super conservative Christian broadcaster who just died not too long ago, he wrote a book back then with that name, the New World Order, and, you know, the whole thing, shady financiers and the Trilateral Commission trying to bring about the Antichrist, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, it's like a hodgepodge of old, often anti-Semitic tropes. And so you're saying that the Great Reset gave that old New World Order a new branding. Yes, and a new life as well. Like, think about all this anxiety about the pandemic, right? It, it supercharged this conspiratorial thinking. Conspiracy theory is one of the things that people do to cope with uncertainty. And the pandemic was a very uncertain time. So, you know, the New World Order absorbed eating bugs as one of the more salacious subplots before the pandemic. And fast forward to 2022, it is intertwined again with the Great Reset. Via more blog posts? Well, now it's a meme. It has upgraded. You have this conservative pundit named Noor Bin Laden saying this meme on the streaming show hosted by Steve Bannon, the former advisor to Donald Trump. Wait, Bin Laden, like... Bin Laden, Bin Laden? Yeah, she's Osama Bin Laden's niece. Okay, wow, we are on a journey. Okay. That's a different story. Okay. <laughs> so on Steve Bannon's show, Noor Bin Laden has a message directed towards the head of the World Economic Forum. And as a wrap-up, I would like to share a message to Klaus for him to tell his own masters that... Like, very serious, not joking. My name is Noor Bin Laden. I am a human being, not a QR code. I don't want to eat the bugs. I don't want to live in the pod. I don't want to be trapped in a digital jail and nothing they can do will make... When she said it, versions of this meme has already been so all over the place. They were printed on t-shirts and mugs that you can buy online. (laughs) 
Okay, so this might be a little bit of a stretch, um, but when we were covering the unrest in Charlottesville back in 2017, we heard the white supremacists who assembled there chanting, Jews will not replace us. Mm. That was a reference to a conspiracy theory that held that uh, Jewish people were planning to reduce the number of white people in Europe and Australia and the U.S. and replace them and their cultures with people of color and with immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like the Great Reset has some echoes of the Great Replacement. Mm, I mean, the common element in both conspiracy theories are the Jewish puppeteers, right? The master that bin Laden's referring to. But that's not unique to either the Great Reset or the Great Replacement. It's just like a very common ingredient in the conspiracy soup. Like, the Great Reset just added some mealworms for a little crunch. (laughs) (laughs) El Jingo. I mean, yeah. I mean, okay, hey, hey, seriously, right? This conspiracy theory is so intriguing to me because it doesn't only appeal to fear, which is classic, but it also appeals to disgust. Like, it's so common and visceral. Like, like racist fear, food disgust is a culturally specific thing with its own long history and backstory. I mean, it is fascinating to me as someone who grew up eating silkworms. So I did some research and found that this disgust, in part, comes from how the early colonizers defined what a who is European or civilized and what a who is not. Hold up, hold up, I'm sorry. You said a lot there, but you ate, you ate silkworms for real? Yes, but... Is that what Kutcher did? <laughs> I mean, yes, uh, I promise I'm not going to try and convert you. Listen, you couldn't. <laughs> We're going to get into who's disgusted by bugs and who isn't after this break. Stay with us, y'all. Jean. Jingnan. Code Switch. And Wong Jingnan covers how people produce, pass around, and make sense of information. And for our purposes today, that means conspiracy theories. And in particular, this one theory (laughs) that holds that the Western world is under attack by powerful people who are trying to force us all to eat bugs. Yes, but it's not only conspiracy theories, okay? A handful of restaurants right here in America that serve patrons bugs on purpose. What is that? Yep, it's a locust. And it's supposed to be them. We know what you're feeling. Repulsion, right? For most Americans, insects are signifiers of filth. You know, journalists know that people are repulsed by bugs and frame the stories accordingly, right? Like, just picture those crickets on the tongue, writhing worms in the box. Yeah, you could hear it in that clip, right? They're just like, ugh. That gross out, I mean, that's a big part of why this is catchy, though. Yes, and the idea that, like, this could be a climate solution, Mm -hmm. that you can save the planet by eating these creepy crawlies. Like, isn't that super intriguing? But what if it actually had the potential to save the planet? Our planet. But I think insects are a very important piece of the solution. With the growing population and rising costs of food, the rest of the world just might be onto something. Yeah, so this story, the bug eating story, definitely goes like in and out of fashion every once in a while, you know what I mean? It's easy, and obviously it gets a reaction. Uh, but that reaction... That's a colonial thing? Are we colonized because we grow up by bugs? Well, kind of. It goes, I mean, this history goes all the way back to when Christopher Columbus sailed. Of course. It always comes back to Christopher Columbus or Ronald Reagan. Oh, God. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. When you look into the archives, right, we see the Europeans actually used to eat bugs, like in the classical antiquity times. In Aristotle's The History of Animals, he wrote this about cicadas. At first, the males are the sweeter eating, but after copulation, the females, as they are full then of white eggs. Nope, 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 nope. We just had a brood of cicadas descend on D.C. two summers ago. They are huge. They have big red eyes. Absolutely not. <laughs> Sounds like you missed the opportunity to add them to your diet. No, I did not. I wish I could have caught some, but there are barely anywhere. When they come back in 15 years, I'm going to send you a box so you can just grill them up and enjoy. <laughs> That's all you. Okay, before that, though, consider the moth grubs. Moth grubs. Pliny the Elder documented that the Roman epicures of his day enjoyed moth grubs fattened on flour and wine. Flour and wine? Ooh, that sounds so French. (laughs) French moth grubs. I'm sorry. So wait, what happened? You had Greeks and you had Romans just going to town on bugs. So why didn't their descendants? We don't know exactly why. Some researchers hypothesized that it could be because of um, some centuries of harsh winters in parts of Europe beginning in the 13th century. And that 
colder winter likely resulted in smaller insect population. Huh. So a different kind of climate change. Yes, regional and very moderate change compared to today. So, you know, researchers have hypothesized that since there were a few bugs, so then there were a few bugs to eat, and that could have contributed to the culture going away. Huh. That's, huh, fascinating. And, you know, in the Americas and other parts of the world, insects remain part of people's diets. Indigenous people harvested swarms of grasshoppers that drowned in lakes and were naturally dried and salted. And they also ground ants into flour. Hmm. When the European colonists arrived in America, they were scandalized by the indigenous people's diets, which included bugs. Diego Alvarez Chanca, who sailed with Christopher Columbus on his second voyage, wrote this in a letter. They eat all the snakes and lizards and spiders and worms that they find upon the ground. So that, according to my judgment, their bestiality is greater than that of any beast upon the face of the earth. And uh, I think he was using bestiality slightly differently than we might use it today. He means animal-like when we tend to mean uh, something else, like really liking the animals. <laughs> uh, but what he's saying is he saw what indigenous people in the Americas, what they were eating, which included, like you said, bugs. Yep. And he thought it marked them as backwards and savage and beneath them. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. And that means the colonists were not going to eat the bugs. Here's an hmm. expert who researched it. There was um, very much an idea that you are what you eat back then. And so the Europeans felt they need European foods. Uh, so there is a very much a worry that if you ate the indigenous foods, you would become a savage. Whose voice are we hearing there, Jingna? She is Julie Lesnick, an anthropologist at Wayne State University in Detroit. She studies entomophagy, or insect eating. And Entomophagy. Okay. Wow. New word alert. Okay. <laughs> Lesnick wrote an article tracing this colonial history of eating bugs or um, reluctance to eat bugs in right. America. She says, um, we don't have much information between then and now, but that this repulsion probably became a learned thing over time. I think it just kind of gets recapitulated every generation. Like it's the same thing and it just becomes the same thing again because the seed was planted in the generation before. The key here is that disgust is socially reinforced. Huh. Like babies don't find bugs disgusting until they're a little older, right? Yeah, I can tell you as the parent of a very young child that they put everything into their mouths. But yeah, we've heard some version of this all the time. The colonizers come to think about the people they're colonizing as backwards. And their justification is always like about this elemental stuff, right? Like what people wear and the ways they worship and how they organize their families. And in this case, what they ate. And this idea that we are the civilized um, and that we have, you know, the best and are the best. And so insects are so easy for people to other and associate with people that are not the best and not civilized. It's like the easiest punching bag. One of the ways people often define who they are is by pointing out who they're not. Like when Michael No says he wants to live like a civilized person and not a Vietnamese farmer. Right, exactly. But what happened with most American families is not what happened with, say, Mexicans. In Oaxaca, Mexico, people have long eaten chapulines, grasshopper. And as Oaxacans have migrated to places like Southern California in particular, they have brought their cuisine with them. You can find chapulines in grocery stores there. There's like the chapulin salt. And so that's just ground up chapulines with salt. And that's probably the most common way you're going to find it as a sort of seasoning. That's Jason De Leon. He got really into chapulines when he went to Mesoamerica for his anthropology field work. He says his wife remains skeptical, though. <laughs> I like the lime and chili, you know, and if I can, if I can get them real spicy, I like that. You know, that's that's great, too. Kind of like Takis. They're crispy, too. Because you're literally, you're, you're, you know, you're biting into that, like, exoskeleton. And I think people get weirded out when they have, like, a, grasshopper foot stuck between their teeth, you know, and they're like, you know, I mean, because it's like all the pieces, right? Yeah, I mean, one way in which they're not like Takis is that Takis don't have legs, <laughs> right? Come on. And yes, this is us, of course, doing that, you know, gross out baby thing that we just talked about before. I'm a, I'm a cop to it. We're doing the same thing. <laughs> For sure. I mean, Jason says that why American palates are often skeptical of new cuisines, they're not immovable. You know, I grew up in the generation where you know, where sushi was like, oh, my God, over in Japan, they're eating raw fish. Can you believe that? Right. OK, but we've established that in the U.S., eating bugs is still a really rare thing. Um, and just to go back to what Jason said, I, I feel like eating bugs might have a slightly higher floor to clear, a higher bar to clear for Americans than sushi did to becoming, if not mainstream food, then at least like unremarkable food. Because like for starters, unlike sushi, 
which used to be thought of as like fancy cosmopolitan people food, right? Like, as we keep hearing, people think of some stuff like bug eating as poor folks food, you know? I mean, many once upon a time poor people food have ended up in fine dining. Like lobsters, cocoa vine, barbecue. That's fair, okay. But okay, I take it, like, different kinds of food seem to have been associated with the different kind of people that consume them, especially mm-hmm. when that group kind of sticks out in some way, like poor people, right, immigrants. I think of how half of all Asian Americans are born outside of the U.S., and many from Southeast Asia would have had insects growing up. Huh, so they might have, like, some like, cultural memory of, like, yeah. F- yeah, eating food. Right. But that seems like... Part of this too, right? Like the people Mm. in the U.S. for whom insect eating might not be conceptually that big a deal. There are also people who might really easily be written off as kind of conditionally American to begin with. Sure. And related to this, I mean, I can't help but think about beef here because beef is kind of treated as this quintessentially American thing. Beef. It's what's for dinner. Like, for real, like in some real ways... A lot of Americans see beef consumption as their birthright, as part of, like, American identity, even as a totem of (laughs) virile American masculinity. The Texas double whopper. He like a man. Man. And so when Tucker Carlson warns his TV audience that there are these people out there who want to take away your beef and replace it with wriggling bugs, you can kind of see how that might activate lots of people. Like, used to have a steak, used to have a burger. Now... He's a silkworm. Eat it like the cuck you are. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not even some effeminate soy boy. I know. Now yeah. you're a brainwashed, complying bug eater. And when you comply, you're bowing to the powerful, unelected figures who are running our lives. Oh, my God. Okay, so I know this is the central tenet of the Great Reset Conspiracy Theory. But it's not really all that outlandish. You know what I mean? Like... Yeah. I mean, last year, a pollster who worked with Democratic candidates asked respondents if they agreed with the statement that the federal government is controlled by a secret cabal. 53% of Republicans agreed with that. And so did 41% of independents and 37% of Democrats. Huh. That's, wow, okay. So, that, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Like, the idea that our government works, actively works to advance the desires of a small number of very powerful, very rich people, like, when you think about it like that, like, I'm surprised the numbers of people answering yes to that question are that low, to be honest. The thing is, that poll was a way to get at people's QAnon beliefs. Huh. Like, that statement is a central statement of the QAnon conspiracy theory. As you just said, honestly, like, you don't have to be red pill to subscribe to this. The conspiracy theories are built on these kernels of truth. But just because these conditions exist, right, you know, skepticism towards, you know, the powerful... Um, bugs making us go ick. That doesn't mean that you're like going to end up red pill, though. Right. There's no neat formula leading people to adopt these ideas. We don't really know why people get caught up in them. What we do know is that certain categories of people have picked up these ideas more. Unvaccinated, male, conservative, Trump voting, Republican, and also not college educated. And conspiracy theories from pundits to politicians leverage these true-sounding ideas and widespread feelings and distort them. Their actions introduce distraction and division where there is consensus. Pure research shows that strong majorities of Americans support some sort of goals and actions to mitigate the effects of climate change. So then squabbling over a marginal idea, like eating insects, that gets in the way of pushing for climate change measures like eating less meat or reducing emissions. Exactly. We see this happening with cars too. Some great recent conspiracy theory believers were up in arms in the UK because a municipal government proposed reducing car use in city centers. They say it's a ploy by the government to take away people's cars and turn cities into, quote, open air prisons. Wow. (laughs) Okay. So I guess people, I mean, are just going to be stuck in traffic jams. And stuck with more emissions. Mm -hmm. You can see this feedback loop between the grassroots conspiracy theorists and politicians like Thierry Baudet. The politicians capitalize on the attention-grabbing nature of these claims. And as they are capitalizing, they also give the conspiracy theory more name recognition, even if Baudet's party loses in the most recent election. So to wrap up, There is this broad skepticism of government floating out there, right? And then you add these unstated racial anxieties in the mix, right? 
Things like, you know, white status laws because of demographic change. You know, all that talk about, this isn't the America that I grew up in. And which, of course, has been a very effective button to push for a lot of American political history. And then, on top of that, you throw in people eating nasty-ass bugs. Not nasty, <laughs> but yes, bugs with the all the unpleasant associations and learned disgust. All right, fine, sure, 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 whatever. <laughs> Plenty of people who fall into all those social demographic buckets associated with higher levels of conspiratorial thinking and are grossed out by bugs will never believe this stuff. Right. The way that people see the world is really idiosyncratic. Okay, yeah, so, huh, right. So there's a larger social context in which these theories can take root. And then there's, like, just human-level stuff that makes certain people just go all in on them. Right, and then the other people use this to get attention and attack things they don't like. So given this stew of discontent and uncertainty we're all living through right now, we shouldn't be surprised if we start to hear more people declaring in the coming months and years emphatically that they, too, will not eat the bugs. All right, y'all. That's our show. You can get at us on Instagram at NPR Code Switch, all one word. If email is more your bag, ours is code switch at npr.org. And subscribe to the podcast on NPR One or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was produced by Jess Kung and edited by Daria Motada and Brett Neely. Our engineer is Robert Rodriguez. Thanks to Jerome Sokolovsky for translating the Dutch speech. Also, thanks to Jerome and Kasia Popielski for their voices. And shout out to the rest of the Code Switch Massive. That's Christina Kala, Courtney Stein, Leah Danella, Verilyn Williams, Lori Lizaraga, B.A. Parker, and Steve Drummond. As for me, I'm Gene Demby. And I'm Ho Jing Nan. Be easy, yo. Peace. All right, Jing Nan, we got to talk. We got to talk. Because <laughs> you mentioned way back before the break that you grew up eating silkworms. Mm-hmm. I have questions because... What questions? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I guess for starters, how do they taste? I mean, what do they taste like? Mm, the closest thing I can think of is popcorns with a very specific flavor. The outside is like, you know, brown meat, and the inside is, um, it's, it's like what your hair smells like after you burn it and before it turns into crisp. That doesn't sound like popcorn it, at all to me. Crunchy, crunchy, crispy. Crunchy and crispy, okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. But and again, they're kind of small. You don't, you don't, you don't need to chew up. They're like, so like, like. The popcorn level. Oh, okay. Small. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, you just do you like season them with anything or? Stir fry with soy sauce. Okay. And my mom, my mom would just get them from the wet market, you know? It's mm-hmm. just not, it's not an everyday thing, but it's like no fancy food. You know, it's just like very basic stir, stir fry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's not like shrimp. It's not like shrimp. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you could put anything in, in uh, fried rice and, and soy sauce and like probably make it pretty good. That is true. But the protein, you can make it up. Thank you for that, Jingnan. The next time I eat popcorn, I'll be thinking about worms. So thank you for corrupting my brain. Try the actual silkworm, and then you will have a positive association. Okay. I'm going to take you up on that. (laughs) Maybe.